Uh, so thank you for joining this session. Um, so this session is actually somewhat of a continuation of my morning session, uh, where we look at how to develop electrical engineering programs uh, economically within the school system. And there's going to be a lot of commonalities uh, in the theme of this presentation as well, as we pull in those ideas of electrical engineering uh, into the computer science curriculum and looking at the hardware aspects of AI, uh, which tend to get overlooked a lot. Um, so I'm not going to talk a lot on how to build circuits, experiments, because I cover that a lot in the morning, uh, but there's going to be a lot of reference to it uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, so just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm the senior steam coach here at SSIS, uh, but I also run a not-for-profit organization called Sino Exchange, and uh, in conjunction with a few other partners, uh, we've been looking at developing materials that blend uh, different curriculums together, particularly the English, the Canadian, as, uh, with the goals of the Chinese Central Party for long-term economic development, uh, and trying to come up with something that is more of a hybrid that would uh, meet kind of a broad range of, of requirements. Um, and we make this material available for free uh, to provide equal opportunity for students who may not be able to afford private education. Uh, so we just launched our web platform this year. Um, so we're on the left, you can see the partners uh, that are contributing to this. We're all full-time teachers and we volunteer our time and services. Uh, so all of the um, projects and uh, labs and so forth, uh, they're all freely available on our website. Um, we have lots of different logic gates experiments uh, that we did cover a lot in the morning session. But the examples for these, they can all be downloaded free of charge. There's no ads, no subscriptions. Uh, anyone can access these materials. So I'm just going to quickly pop out just for a moment. Um, and I'm just going to open up the website uh, so you know where to go should you like what you see today and want to uh, implement anything on your own. Uh, so here's our main website. And so under resources, we have a whole section on circuit design. And this covers circuits for both um, that cover a lot of the physics curriculum, the DT curriculum, and the computer science curriculum. Um, and you can see down here a whole section. So I'm just going to choose um, uh, alternative logic gate designs, for example. Uh, we have all the information in both English and Chinese, so if you're working with bilingual students, that's really helpful. Uh, and you can see the different schematics, explanations of how they work, video tutorials. And if you want to use any of these experiments in your own class, uh, you can just click on the actual project sheet. Uh, you can download it, print it. Uh, they all have visual representations, circuit diagrams, building materials, etc. Uh, so it's really easy to implement that. Um, in addition to all of those experiments, sorry, I should have get back there. Um, everything that you see today, um, it's very easy to talk about wonderful ideas and making change and then leave it up to the person to do it themselves. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, so we're actually uh, just in the process of translating the entire course that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so as it gets translated, it will become available with PowerPoint presentations, handouts, tests, and entities. Everything will be available uh, on the website. Uh, so here's an overview of the entire curriculum revisions that we've proposed. Now, of course, it's not going to be directly aligned with the ITCSC, but if you want to implement it as either an enrichment activity or supplement to your existing curriculum or mix and match, uh, that's completely up to you. Uh, we will provide the materials. It's up to you how you'd like to use them. Uh, so that's a little bit about um, our not-for-profit organizations. So hopefully, uh, give you a bit of inspiration. Um, so one of the things I really want to talk about um, is this aspect, uh, and this has kind of been coming up again and again and again in the news, is the need for educational reform, particularly in the computer science curriculum. And it really surprised me when I saw uh, this article right here, and you look at all of these high skill shortages in the UK in particular, electrical engineer, circuit engineer, computer engineer, they're all the engineering side of computer science. And I was surprised because there's so much electrical engineering theory in the IGCSE physics curriculum, in the DT curriculum, and in theory, in the computer science curriculum. And yet, despite being well covered in, in practice, we still have these major skill shortages. So what I'm going to be talking today is how we can make minor changes to the computer science curriculum to really address the advancement of AI from a hardware standpoint. because. A lot of emphasis is being placed on the software, uh, but not a lot on developing hardware systems to advance AI. Um, so to address that area, while also addressing these kill, uh, key skill areas uh, that we are currently struggling with, not only in England, but also these are key objectives uh, for the Chinese Central Party, wanting to make sure that they have these skills uh, in the future. 
So I'd like to start with this idea from Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Uh, and this is where I'd like to start with this idea of presentation with AI, because there's a lot of just misunderstanding about AI, and we basically put it up, it's basically magic for most people, and we don't really understand what it is or where it's coming from. Uh, so AI, if you're not a computer science teacher, we have a few math teachers in here, we have a few DT teachers, and there's a few other people who are not computer sciences. Uh, but one thing with AI is it's still bound by rules. Okay? We do not have any form of truly random numbers yet. There's no real true sentience in any of our AI platforms right now. All we have is algorithm built on algorithm built on algorithm. So it, it appears to be a sentient, but at the end of the day, it's still only making binary choices. So we don't actually have AI in my opinion. Um, I think this is more of a sales pitch uh, loss to try to get people interested. We're, really, what I would say is we have intelligent algorithm design, not artificial intelligence. Uh, so we really need to start looking at our computer systems and how do we build computer systems, how do we think about computer systems, and how can we bridge this gap between intelligent algorithm and get to true artificial intelligence. Now, true, true advancements in AI, in my opinion, will require more sophisticated hardware and algorithms. Okay, if we continue just to do software development, all we're going to do is build platforms that are still based on the, the rules of the current system. So we need to take a look at how do hardware engineers and computer engineers build circuits that can think for themselves or can mimic human thought process, take a look at how they work, why they work, and identify the shortcomings and try to figure out how can we take the next step. Because after all, the CPU basically can only do one of two things. Okay? We can either have on or off, true or false, zero or one, and so all of our decisions are only just binary. So the first thing we need to do is figure out how can we go from these very simple binary decisions to something that can simulate human thought, figure out what are the shortcomings and how can we overcome those shortcomings. So in my opinion, uh, we need to make advancements in the following. We do need to identify a way to create truly random numbers if we want AI. We either need to make advancements in quantum computing or something other. Um, so if we get quantum computing, rather than having on or off, we would have on, off, or neither, uh, which would then open up a world of possibilities. And there are, we're getting closer and closer. But I actually think it's going to come more likely from novel circuit design. And what I mean by this is new and innovative circuit design set are completely different from our current paradigm of computing. Uh, and one thing I think is really interesting is some of the work coming out of MIT where they're actually re-engineering viruses. Um, the one they're doing right now, they're actually taking the protein of an electric eel that can produce up to 10,000 volts, reprogramming a virus to actually replace the DNA of an existing host material and creating an organic battery that can be grown. And I think that's probably where a lot of AI will probably come, is this idea of creating um, basically a pr programmable genetic material, probably a silicon-based DNA life form that can be established with a genetic memory at the beginning and can and create its own synapses like the human brain. So it's somewhere between hardware circuitry and organics, and that's where I think the true breakthroughs in AI will be. But in order to make that leap, we really need to understand current technologies, understand their limitations, and figure out how can we push it to the next level. Okay, so, like I said, we really need to understand both aspects of both hardware and software, not just software, if we really want to address the current shortcomings of our current paradigms. So if we take a look at existing computer science curriculums, uh, they're very, very heavy on programming. Uh, usually, 90% of it is on the programming aspect. And they do introduce many other concepts, uh, and I find they introduce a lot of these concepts in breadth, they cover a lot of broad range, but they don't necessarily go deep into these topics. And they don't necessarily make the necessary connections that I think should be there. But we look at number systems, binary, hexadecimal. We look at logic gate theory, what they do. We look at Boolean algebra. We look at logic gate sequences. Generally, in the ICC curriculum, we have a lot of these arbitrarily contrived logic gate sequences that don't actually relate to actual computer hardware. And then we talk about hardware, what they do, um, but not necessarily understanding how or why they work. So we almost always focus on the software and a lot of times exclude the engineering 
practices, and that's why we have such a skill shortage in the engineering side of things. So once again, I come back to this. So a lot of these shortages are in the engineering field. So what I'd like to do is propose changes within the curriculum. Not a radical change, just modest changes. And what I would say is introduce these connections, number systems, logic gate theory, Boolean algebra, logic gate sequences, and hardware. Almost identical. But actually start looking at the connections between these items. So when we look at logic gate theory, rather than just memorizing what a logic gate does, is actually learn how and why it works, rather than just memorizing rote knowledge. Then when we get to Boolean algebra and logic gate sequences, actually look at logic gate sequences that are relative to computational algorithms and thinking. We already look at logic gate sequences, so why not actually focus on logic gate sequences that are important to computer science, not these arbitrary connections. And then from there, then we can actually look at the logic gate sequences that actually support the hardware in the curriculum. Look at how does an ALU work and why. Look at how can we create a memory circuit with the D-latch. Uh, look at how registers work. Look at how von Neumann architecture actually connects. So then rather than doing all these topics as separate entities, there's actually connections between all of these threads. Okay, and then so once we do these slight modifications, we can then address these critical sectors. Now, rather than me just telling, hey, I think we should make these changes, I'm going to show you what these changes would actually look like. Uh, and we've spent about six years developing this revised curriculum, which we're now in the process of translating. Now, as we go through this presentation, I'm going to go through a lot of information really quick. And if you're not a computer science teacher, this might go way over top of your head uh, with how deep I'm going to go. Uh, but what I would like you to do is to take a step back and think of this as the big picture. Um, Okay. Think of it as a visual narrative, so don't try to focus on every single little detail that I talk about in today's presentation, but think about the story that I'm trying to tell. Um, and then also think about the connections, okay? and that's the key thing that I really want to emphasize with. As we look at ways of revising the curriculum, is how can we make meaningful connections between all of the learning strands. Okay, so our objective today is to look at how can we create an electric circuit that can form logical operations process algorithms, the way that the human brain would work, or as close as we can using a binary system. And hopefully, as students understand our current paradigm, we can move past that and develop new and innovative strategies. So we're going to look at the algorithm, algorithmic logic unit, ALU, which is a key part of computer science. But to understand that, we need to understand logic gates. But to understand logic gates, we need to understand how and why they work. And to do with that, we need to understand transistors. Now, in computer science, we always talk about transistors and Moore's Law, and look, take a look at every two years, the number of transistors will double. But we don't really look at what transistors actually do, why they're important, how they work, and how they connect to all those other themes. So we're going to start small and then work our way up to bigger pieces as we work our way through. All right, so the first thing we need to understand is how do we represent logic gates? And there's a few different ways uh, for computer science and electrical engineers. So as we modify the curriculum, we need to look at both. So logic gates can be shown as either function diagrams, which I'm sure all the computer science teachers are aware of, and electrical schematics, which I'm sure the DT teachers are aware of. Now, they look very different. So on the left, we have a function diagram of the NOT gate. And on the right, we have a function diagram of an OCT gate um, from an electrical engineering standpoint. And the difference between these two is this is just showing us basically an abstract representation so that we can look at the circuit in quick terms and I look at logic gate sequences. But it doesn't show us how it's made, why it works, etc. Over here, we can take a look at all the different connections from our power rail to our ground to the transistors and the resistors and how things connect. And we can start analyzing how this logic gate actually works. Now, the electrical schematics have also become very important as we start getting into more complex logic gates because there are more than one way to build the same logic gate. So the reasons why we use one or the other, function diagrams are easier to work with uh, than electrical schematics, especially when we start getting into complex circuit designs such as a full adder circuit. Um, so we usually use function diagrams in computer so uh, science uh, as we look at the function of what we want the computer to do and not necessarily concern ourselves with how it's going to actually perform that function itself. Now, the thing we do definitely need to do is first learn these three basic logic gates, the and, or, and not. And once we know these, then we can start getting into more complex uh, concepts. So for the non-computer science teacher, uh, this will probably be new for you. Um, so all logic gates um, are basically made up of these three basic ones. So it's like Lego. 
So if you understand and or not, you can build them up just like Lego pieces, adding more and more complexity until you get something very sophisticated. So if you understand these three concepts in math, you can build anything. You could build an entire supercomputer if you understand just these three. Okay, now when we think about uh, what we do with a logic gate, if we have a single wire in a circuit, we can do one of two things. It's binary. The wire can either be on or it can be off. There's nothing really else that we can do with the wire. So we could either just have a wire, which isn't really that useful, or we could think about negating that function. So if the wire is on, then it becomes off and vice versa. And that's the idea behind the NOT gate, is we basically want to negate a value. Take something positive and turn it to negative, or negative to positive. So here we have a simple electrical circuit. Uh, we talk about this in the morning section. Uh, so this circuit, uh, we have a basic NOT gate, and when the switch is turned on, the light is off, and when the switch is off, the light is on. And this is what's happening in a NOT gate. And this is a basic switch logic gate, not a transistor base. And this would be appropriate for a middle school student to build, etc. Um, so what's happening when we turn on, the light is off, and vice versa. So in this circuit, what the reason why it's happening is electricity can go through the switch with no resistance when the switch is turned on, and that forces the light off. However, when we turn the switch off, there's no other path for the electricity to go but through the light, forcing the light to turn on. And that's what's happening from an electrical engineering standpoint. So this is the idea that these students have to develop as they start developing a basic uh, understanding of logic gates and how and why they work. Now, we can summarize this as a logical statement and in mathematical notation. So the NOT gate, the input of Q is on if, or it's not the same as the input of A, essentially. Our function diagram is as such, we've already viewed that. And then we can notate it in a few different ways. So we can do truth tables, and we cover these a lot in, in computer science. Uh, if you're teaching Boolean algebra, you would probably look at it from a mathematical statement, so the inverse of A, or we could summarize it as the inverse of an input. So these are all the different ways that we look at representing this logic. Now the AND gate is a little bit different. The output of Q is on if the inputs A and B are on. Uh, so here we have a circuit. So if A is on, the light is off. If B, if A and B are both on, the light is on. But if B is on and A is not on, then the light is not on. And so this is basically just a simple series circuit, which we cover in the IGCSE for, uh, physics curriculum in middle school, etc. Uh, so this is how it would apply to computer logic. Uh, so once again, if we summarize this uh, as a truth table and in mathematical notation, we get the output of 0, 0, 0, 1, so there's only one possible combination in which the light would be turned on. And in Boolean algebra, we notate this as A dot B, where both are true. Finally, we have the OR gate, so the uh, output of Q is on if the inputs A or B are turned on. Uh, so here, rather than being a series circuit, it's actually a parallel circuit. So if A is on, the light will be on. If B is on, the light will be on. And if A and B are on, there's two paths for the power to go through to the light, and the light will still be on. So this gives us a different output than the AND gate, and this is how and why it works. Okay, so when we look at the truth table, we get something a little bit different. We do 0, 1, 1, 1, and in Boolean algebra, we notate this as A plus B. Um, so that can be a little bit confusing for uh, students who are used to primary math, and they see A plus B. Um, it's a little bit different, uh, and in this case, it's either are true. So once we understand the three basic logic gates, we can build everything else in the computer. So the next thing I would do is look at, let's talk about universal logic gates, our NAND and our NOR functions. So how do we basically build our LEGO block circuits together to create more sophisticated functions? So our two universal gates, NAND and NOR, uh, these are universal gates, and universal gates are very special because they are the only gates that can actually recreate any logical function that you wanted. You can create a NOT gate, a NAND gate, an OR gate, um, so there's some fun activities you can do to emphasize that point. Uh, but they're basic combinations. So the NAND gate, the output of uh, Q is on if both A and B are not on. So you can see AND NOT from a logical standpoint. Um, so in this case, we notate it as A dot B with a line over top to indicate the negation. And it's the opposite of AND. So rather than being 0, 0, 0, 1, we get 1, 1, 1, 0. Now if we look at how this is created, the NAND gate is created by taking the AND gate and then immediately following it by a NOT gate. And this inverses the function. Now the NOR gate, very similar, so the output of Q is only on if the, either the a inputs A or B are not on. So in this case, we get A plus B with a line over top for the negation, opposite of OR, and that gives us 1, 0, 0, 0 instead. Now, 
once again, we're negating the function of the OR gate, uh, and we can't really build this with the switches that I showed before. But if we switch to a more advanced theory and start looking at transistors, then we're able to daisy chain logic gates together to take the output of one into the input of another. Um, and this works really good with modular circuits, uh, such as these, where we can build a, net, a NOT gate, build an OR gate, connect them together, and then the students can actually experiment and see how the electronics work. Finally, we have the two exclusive logic gates, the XOR, exclusive OR, and exclusive NOT OR. And these, this is where things start getting a lot more exciting for us in computer science. So the XOR, the output of Q, is either on if the inputs A or B are exclusively on. So this is a little bit different than the OR gate, where it could be A or B or both. In this case, we end up, uh, we notate it as A with a circle plus 2. The circle indicates exclusive in Boolean algebra. And we get 0, 1, 1, 0, okay, where the oops, OR gate, we had 0, 1, 1, 1. So it's a slightly different logic than our basic OR gate. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at exactly 1 is true. Now, the exclusive OR gate is created using logic gate sequences. And when we talk about um, logic gate sequences, we cover this a lot in the IGCS and curriculum, where we will build up logical sequences. And typically, they are between 3 to 7 logic gates. But I find the exam basically covers the same three or four examples again and again and again. And basically the students are just memorizing these examples, uh, not really getting into understanding how or why they work. And the examples do not actually relate to ar the architecture of a computer. So why not actually look at, let's learn how the things that we're learning about in the other aspects of the curriculum are actually made, rather than these arbitrary circuits. Now the design of this circuit, basically what we're doing is we're taking the output of a NAND gate, and we're comparing it to the output of an OR gate, and then we're taking the combined results that are similar by using the AND gate. Uh, so this will allow us to uh, basically cross-examine these two outputs and come up with a new output. Now, because the exclusive OR gate is so common in computer science, it gets its own function diagram. So here we can see how it's actually made out of a series of logic gates, and here we can see it as its own logic gate as its, by itself. But once we go back to this idea of the Lego analogy, although this has a simple representation as a function diagram, the electrical circuitry that makes this is really complicated. And that's why in computer science we typically go with function diagrams, and then we pass it off to the computer engineers to figure out how to make it work. All right, and then we have the exclusive not or, which is basically the exact same thing, but we're negating it, um, and that gives us our final output, which is 1001. Okay, so we have seven different logic gates, and with these, we can build some really sophisticated circuits that can do really complex computations. Okay? And there's our final summary of how the exclusive non or would work as a function diagram. And so it's appropriate complexity from an IGCSE level for logic gates in the series uh, to give us a new output. All right, so let's summarize and review what we've done so far. Okay. So with one wire, we can basically have one of two electrical states. It's going to be either on or off. However, with more wires, if we add a second wire, we double the number of wires, so we get four combinations. And each time we add an additional wire to our circuit, the number of possible outcomes doubles. So we go 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. And this starts to should ring a bell if you've ever bought computer memory or hard drives. Uh, so everything is on 2 to the power of n, uh, and that's where we can start getting these specific values. Now, electrical states from multiple inputs can be added, excluded, inverted, etc., through a series of different circuits. And this is where our Boolean algebra starts becoming very important. Uh, but we also want to go beyond just the math and start looking at the engineering standpoint. Uh, so all of these different functions are done through logic gates. Uh, these are the building blocks of every single computer circuit in the world. So if you understand the and or not, essentially we can build all of our universal and our exclusive gates, and if we understand that, then we can build our ALU, we can look, build our RAM, etc. Okay, so once again, there's seven commonly used logic gates, the AND or NOT, these are our primaries, our two universals, NAND and NOR, and our exclusive XOR and XNOR. Okay, and if you understand these seven things, you can do everything in computer science with our current paradigm in place. All right, so let's go into introduction to basic transistor-based logic gates. And this is where it starts deviating from our existing computer science curriculum because we generally don't look at how and why uh, logic gates work in the existing curriculum. Uh, but we do cover this in the IGCSE physics and in the DT. So we're just 
it's not that it's not there, it's just those connections aren't typically made. So let's start with the three basic logic gate designs uh, using transistors. Uh, so this is our NOT gate, and what you can see is uh, right now the power is coming from the top and it's going out to the output. So when the transistor is off, the power is forced to the output. However, if we supply a small amount of power to the base of the transistor, the transistor opens. It's basically a switch. And what happens is rather than the power going to the output, the power will go through the transistor straight to the ground because there's no resistance, causing it to invert the formula. So this is actually not that difficult to understand how and why this circuit works. Um, but as we get into more complex logic gates, it does get a little bit more complicated, but still within reason. All right, so when we look at the AND gate, uh, so currently uh, both A and B are off, so the power goes to transistor A and it cannot go any further, so the output is off. If we so turn on switch A, the power can go to transistor B, but it can go no further, so once again our output is off. If we open B, but not A, power can't get to B, so it doesn't matter, the output is off. But if we open up power to both A and B, A and B both open up, power will go from the, the rail and out to their, our output. Now the reason why the power doesn't go to the ground in this case is we've added a, a resistor down here, which then forces the power to go to the output unless the, the, uh, the power exceeds that of the, the load, and then any extra power would be grounded, preventing our circuit from being fried. So, again, not overly complicated. Uh, this is within reason for uh, the IGCC physics curriculum when we look at circuits. And then finally, our OR gate. This is our basic electrical schematic for our OR gate. So right now, A and B are turned off, so Q is off. If I supply power to transistor A, there is a single path. So right now, power is going to transistor A and B, but it can go no further here. But it can go through A out to my output. If I open up B, it doesn't go through A, it does go to B, through B, and out to the output. And if I open up A and B, it goes through both transistors and two paths to the output and that gives us our logical outcome of the OR gate. So now, we basically have our three schematics for our AND or NOT, and using our LEGO analogy, we can then build any other logic gate that we want, and with enough time and effort, we can build a supercomputer uh, with our students. So let's take a look at our compound gates, uh, so our NAND and NOR gates, so we're basically going to be taking two logic gates together, um, and once again, I'm just going to ask, so why do we call AND or NOT basic logic gates? They're the basic components. So once we know them, then we can use them to build anything else. Okay, so every other logic gate is a building block that's made out of these. Okay, so the NAND is basically just the AND followed by the NOT. So let's just build this NAND gate up like a Lego block. So here we have the electrical schematics for a NAND gate. And if you look closely, we have the AND gate. And then all we do is we follow it up by the NOT gate. We put it together and we now have a NAND gate. And we can see the electrical schematics. So once students understand how to build these three, they can build compound gates quickly and easily. Again, the NOR gate is just the OR gate followed by the NOT gate, so the same idea. Okay, all we have to do is build these up like Lego blocks, take the OR gate, which we already know, follow it with the NOT gate, and now we have the NOR gate. Again, this always gets simplified as a single uh, diagram in a function diagram, but now we can start looking at the electrical schematics and seeing how things connect. Now, one thing that's really important for electrical engineers and computer engineers is to simplify things. And so this starts getting away from the core of the computer science and starts getting into more of the engineering side of things. But it's important to look at how can we make computers smaller, faster, cheaper, generate less heat, um, uh, reduce power consumptions, etc. So one of the things we want to be able to do is logic gate simplification. Uh, and a whole bunch of experiments on this. But what we want to do is we want to take this NAND gate and we want to simplify it to these fewer parts uh, to make it cheaper, smaller, lighter, and more efficient. And this is where advanced theories of electrical engineering start coming into to play. Uh, so right here, once again, so we have our NAND gate followed by our NOT gate. This is the simplest way to build it uh, because we can just build up using um, a kind of a Lego-like assembly model. But we can simplify this to this. And you can see Rather than having three transistors, I only have two transistors. Rather than having five resistors, I only have two resistors. So the number of components, I'm using 60% fewer components in the second design, and it will actually achieve the exact same thing. And this type of experiment and 
exploration, it's really important for students to think about not just getting stuck in the paradigm of only one way to do things. We need people who are innovative and will challenge the rules, uh, to, will find new and creative solutions to come up with the same problem. So let's just go through and let's prove this proof to make sure that I'm not just pulling your tail and lying to you. Let's actually make sure this circuit works as I claim it does. Alright, so here's a little bit bigger here in the back so you can see. So just two, two resistors, two transistors, and that's it. Alright, so if A and B are off, power will then have nowhere to go but to the output. So that gives us one on our 0, 0, 1. Now, if I turn on B, well, power can't get down, down to B, so the power still goes to my output. If I turn on A, can't get through B, so the power still goes to my output. But if I turn on A and B, then the power will go straight to the ground, and I get my truth table 1110, which is in fact the truth for the NAND gate. So although we've come up with a different solution, it actually still provides the same proof. And this is a really good concept for students to learn about alternative methods and how can we optimize and maximize computer circuitry design. All right, so now moving into exclusive logic gates. Uh, so once again, anything can be created by using those three basics and or not. We build them up uh, and then we can create more and sophisticated logics. But then we can also simplify these more complicated designs as well. So the exclusive OR gate is made out of a NAND gate, an OR gate, and a NAND gate. And the NAND gate is actually just an AND and a NOT. So we actually have four logic gates that create this. Um, so the circuitry gets pretty complicated for this as a, a compound gate. Uh, so here we have it as a function diagram, so we can figure out kind of the big ideas and then we can break that down into electrical schematics. So we have our AND gate, we need that. We have our OR gate, we need this. We have our NOT gate, and now we need to basically assemble things like Lego blocks to create that function diagram that I just showed you. Now that gives us this monstrosity of a circuit, and this is an exclusive OR gate um, using a compound logic gate method. But once students know that AND or NOT, and they keep having opportunities to build up, they can get to the point where they can start building this on their own. But once again, we want to be able to simplify that. So this particular logic gate, and I um, do is, uh, this as a project where I get all the kids in my class to do different variations of this, and I showed a video uh, of this as a project in the morning session. Um, but here we can see our AND gate, our OR gate, our NOT gate, and our AND gate uh, to create our exclusive OR. Uh, but to compare that with alternative designs, we can build it using diodes only, or we can create a hybrid design using diodes and transistors to create a new simplified exclusive OR logic gate. Um, so, once again, these are all representing the same logic. This is a little bit easier for the students to build based off of a basic knowledge of computer uh, engineering. These circuits are simpler, but the theory behind how and why they work is far more complicated. Um, so we can bring the students through a whole progression of theory related to computer science, mathematics, and electrical engineering, and explore all these different concepts of building up circuits and then revising these circuits and looking for ways to optimize and simplify them. Okay, so like anything, we can simplify circuits. Uh, now from a circuit standpoint, if you work in uh, the morning session, I always get the uh, kids in my class to do practical experiments, and I do them as these modular circuits. Uh, this is actually a part of uh, the exploration of how power rectifier works. Uh, so we have a few circuits followed by a full wave rectifier, which uh, converts AC to DC power stabilizer, which then converts to a stable 5 volt power. Uh, the next circuit would be a timing signal generator, which is a key component of the control unit in an ALU. And then it goes into their um, the logic gate sequences like this. So I always build these modular circuits where they do a single experiment, they keep that experiment for the future, and that experiment becomes part of a much bigger experiment. And over the course of the year, we do this big, huge, massive computer that ends up linking together as uh, individual circuits. All right, so let's move into logic gate sequences, which is a core part of the existing curriculum, but let's take a look at how we can look at sequences a little bit different to give more meaning to those examples. All right, so the first thing we want to do is look at how can we create a, uh, a logic gate sequence that can solve a math problem. This is the most important thing in computing, is computational algorithms. Okay, so we have this simple equation, uh, basically 1 plus 1, uh, so we have a few different outputs. 0 plus 0 would be 0, 1 plus 1 would be 1, or 1 plus 1 equals 2. So let's create a circuit that could do this thinking for us. Now, I would give the students, of course, time to try to figure this out, but this is the simplest addition circuit that we have. 
Um, so basically, we look at the combinations that would give us the desired outcomes. So the NOR gate will give us the output true when we have 0 plus 0. The XOR gate would give us 1 plus 0 or 0 plus 1. And the AND gate would give us a sum of 1 plus 1. So this is the simplest circuit that we could build to addition. Not a very practical circuit, though, because it has limitations. It cannot add numbers greater than 2. Um, so the circuit is seriously limited. But it does give a good entry point for students to understand how we can start designing circuits that can do computational algorithms. Alright, so we're going to move past this simple circuit and we're going to start looking at computational logic, which is very important in both Boolean algebra and computer science. So the most basic thing that we can do is addition. Uh, so that's the first thing we always want to start with in computer science is how can we build a circuit that can add numbers together. Therefore, addition is the most important circuit that we can make in computing science because every other mathematical operation can be thought of in terms of addition. So once we have addition in place, then we can figure out subtraction, and then we can do math, and we can do division. The same way we learn math from preschool all the way up, we always start with addition and move into the other functions. So if we think about subtraction, how would you do subtraction as an addition problem? Negate the second. Good, negate the second. Perfect. All right, so we can do uh, subtraction by adding a negative number. So x equals 5 minus 3 becomes x plus negative 3. Multiplication, how would we do multiplication as addition? Multiple times, good. All right, so we can do add the number multiple times. So 2 times 4 equals 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2. And division is a little bit trickier, but any ideas how we could do division? So how can we do division as a series of addition problems? Fraction. Fraction. Again, this one is a little bit trickier, but basically we subtract it and divide the divisor until we get zero remainder. We count how many times we do that, and that gives us our quotient. So 8 divided by 2 is the same as 8 minus 2 minus 2 minus 2 minus 2, which is the same as 8 plus negative 2 plus negative 2 plus negative 2 plus negative 2. And this is what the computer is actually doing, is it's just repeating the process until it gets to a null and void, uh, and then it counts how many times it does the process, and then that's our answer. So it has to go through the process four times uh, to get to zero, and that's our quotient, that's what we're looking at. So if we understand addition, we can do everything else with that one circuit. Okay? Uh, so that's just a quick summary of how we find to do it. Uh, we count how many times we need to get to the quotient. All right, so now that we have this foundation of we need a circuit that can add, now we're to the point where we want to create a simple adder circuit, something that can do a large sequence of number, that could do mathematics not for 1 plus 1, but could go up to billion or infinity with no limitations. So let's figure out how to make the math work from an engineering standpoint. All right, so in order to do that, we need to understand both binary arithmetic uh, logic gates and combination of logic gates. So there's a whole bunch of different aspects that we need to pull in from math, from computing, from engineering to make this work. All right, so let's start with binary um, rules for binary arithmetic. So zero plus zero is zero, pretty easy. Zero plus one is one, one plus zero is one, and one plus one is zero, carry the one. And one plus one plus one is one, carry the one. Uh, so there's only five rules for binary arithmetic, so it's actually pretty easy to teach. So if we look at all the different uh, combinations, so let's figure out what logic gates we would actually need. So 0 plus 0 is 0, 1 plus 0 is 1, 0 plus 1 is 1, and 1 plus 1 is 1 carry the 1. Um, not 10, but we're looking at 2 in binary. Uh, so we need to basically look at the logic gates that will give us the sequence. So we look at the blue numbers, we need a logic gate that will give us 0, 1, 1, 0. And if we look at the red, well, it's really 0, 0, 0, 1 we look at the second column. So we have two different logic gates that we would need to solve this problem. So what logic gate gives us this outcome 0, 1, 1, 0? Can anyone remember? Yes? I'm thinking. Okay. That's okay. Would it be the OR or exclusive OR? Exclusive. Good. So we need the exclusive OR gate to give us this tree table 0, 0, or 0 1, 1, 0. Uh, so the function diagram for exclusive OR is as follows. And then we also need to th think about the carry bit uh, in that final example. So we need a logic gate that can do 0, 0, 1. And, perfect. 
right? So uh, the AND table, uh, so this is the AND gate. So in order to do basic addition, we needed one exclusive OR gate, one AND gate. Now we need to figure out how do we combine those in a logical way that produces that outcome. And this is what we end up getting, is we take the inputs of A and B, we feed it into both gates, and if we have one plus one, only we'll get the carry bit out. If we have one plus zero, zero plus one, or zero plus zero, zero, we end up getting a sum line. And this is called single additive, okay? And once again, this is within the realm of what would be appropriate for the computer science curriculum. So the next thing we would want to do is look at a full adder circuit, because right now we can only add one plus one, but we can't think about the carry bit yet. So we need to figure out how do we add that carry bit into this equation. All right, so let's just take a look at all of our different tables. Okay, so our combinations, Q1 and Q2. Okay, so this is what's happening currently in the circuit. Um, just breaking it down as a visual representation for all the math teachers in the room. All right, so if we want to add larger values, though, we actually need to add three values. We need to add the input of A plus the input of B plus the carry bit from the previous operation. So we need to be slightly more sophisticated in our diagram. So how can you expand the circuit to do A plus B plus Q? Any ideas? Ladder. Good, a ladder. Okay. Uh, so we're basically going to create this ladder idea, ch daisy chaining them together. All right. So we will actually need two simple adder circuits together. Okay. One adder is going to add A plus B, and that's going to give us the sum. And then we're going to add a second adder to take the output of A plus B and add it to the carry bit. So we already have a circuit that can do addition. All we need is to duplicate it, have it twice. Okay. And then we do need to make one small modification uh, to combine those two. So this is our full adder circuit right here. So basically we have simple adder number one, which is going to add A plus B. Simple adder number two, which is going to add the carry bit from the previous operation. And then we have an OR gate then, which this basically closes off that system and makes everything nice and clean, so we have just a sum of the carry bit out. Um, and then what we can do is we can actually take multiple full adders and add them together in a series so we can get to numbers like 4 or 8, 16, 32, and continue adding them indefinitely until we no longer need to calculate values at large. So this is how it would look like daisy chaining them together. So basically we just stack them vertically, um, and this allows us to calculate larger numbers. Now, this is really cumbersome trying to draw a full adder like that. So in computer science, uh, we, once again, just like we simplify the exclusive OR gate uh, to have its own function diagram, we actually simplify the full adder to have its own function diagram as well. So in computer science, this whole monstrosity of a logic gate sequence, which again, this is only five logic gates, which is within the realm of a computer science question. Obviously, uh, typically go from three to seven, so this is appropriate. Uh, this does get simplified from this to this as a function diagram. And we still have all the inputs, A plus B, we have the carry in, the carry out, and our sum line on the bottom. Now we can add multiple full adders together in series so that we can then start looking at how can we do larger calculations. And we can then prove this does in fact work. So let's go in and do the mathematical proof to make sure I'm not misleading you. So here we have a simple uh, addition problem. So 0 plus 0 is 0. 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 plus 0 is 1. 1 plus 1 is 1. Carry the 1. And we can see the math problem. So this is what we're going to do to solve this. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to distribute the value of A onto all the A inputs. We're going to distribute the values of B along all the B inputs. And then along our sum line, we should get this final output along the sum. Okay, now, I'm going to show this to you really quick, but in this classroom, and this might take five or ten minutes for the students to actually solve on their own. All right, so we have our A input. We're going to distribute all the values for A, which is our top line. Then we're going to go in, distribute the values for B along our top line. And then we're going to do the mass of 0 plus 0 is 0. 0 plus 1 is 1. one 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 plus 1 is 1. Carry the 1. That becomes 1 plus 1, which is 0. And we end up getting the exact same result. So the, the circuitry does work. We proved the circuit. All right? So using this method, we can also do basic addition fairly quickly and um, effectively. And we can continue this on indefinitely to allow computers to do uh, large calculations of very large complex numbers. So moving on to get into a more complex circuit, uh, so I want to get to this idea of an algorithmic logic unit, which is a key component of 
uh, von Neumann architecture, and we talk about it all the time, but students never understand what it is, why it works, etc. So we're actually going to work our way up to this really interesting circuit design. So in order to build an algorithmic logic unit, we need to make some modifications to our full outer circuit. To do this, we need to add a D negate so we can turn uh, addition into subtraction. And to do that, we also need to be able to select between either B or B negate. We need to select if we want a positive or negative number. So we need two circuits in order to modify our full adder. Now this circuit is called a multiplexer. And a multiplexer basically allows us to select either the inputs to A or B. Um, but in order to build a multiplexer, we need a circuit called a decoder. So we're going to start with how to build a decoder. Now a decoder is basically a simple negation circuit that allows us to determine whether or not the input of the wire was true or false. So we take a single input and then give two outputs to determine what the input actually was. Okay, so basically if we look at it from a math standpoint, uh, one wire is equal to the value of x and the other wire is equal to not x. Again, this allows us to decode a basic input. So this is our decoder circuit. Actually, really easy one to think about it. We take x and if x is positive, it goes straight to the line. If x is negative, well then, the not gate will then invert it and we'll have power on the not x line. So we know what the, what the input originally was. Now we can then use that to create a multiplexer. Once again, a multiplexer is within the realm of what's acceptable thank you, uh, for a computer science curriculum. Uh, so this is our multiplexer. We have a decoder as a subcircuit. And this circuit allows us to select either A or B. So depending on what's happening, if S is 1, then we will have 1 on this line. Plus, if we have one on the B, then that will go out to the output. If uh, S is zero, we go to the default of A. So we can select between A or B, depending on the value of S, and get whatever that is on the output. Okay, so really interesting circuit, very powerful circuit as well. Now the multiplexer, once again, is so common in computer science, it gets its own function diagram. Uh, so you can kind of see where I'm going with this idea of building up ideas and then simplifying and then using those ideas into carrying them forward. So our multiplexer, once again, just like a full adder, we can connect into a series to create a whole chain to create a, a selection. So if we have you know, 24 values of A, or 36 values of A, and 36 values of B, then we can do a selection of all of those simultaneously. All right, so uh, here would be a nice little challenge to give to your students to design a circuit that uses a multiplexer to select either an AND gate or an OR gate. So we can do some comparative analysis within computer science. Okay, so to fill that circuit, Okay, here we have an AND gate, an OR gate, followed by our multiplexer. And then this would allow us to basically compare the AND or compare the OR of A and B. Uh, so we can do some comparative analysis quickly by either by selecting 1 or 0 on the multiplexer. So now we're basically looking at the multiplexer as almost like a logic gate does a single element. Um, and this allows us to then simplify these ideas and move on to more advanced concepts. All right, so let's summarize and review what we've gone so far, and I know I'm going really quick. Uh, so by themselves, logic gates have very limited functionality. However, when we combine them into more sophisticated uh, circuits, we can create very complex circuits that can do some really advanced computations. Uh, now, when creating uh, digital circuits, what we want to do is we want to figure out what our desired output is first, and then reverse engineer that output to figure out what series of logic gates we actually need to get to that point. All right, so when we look at our simple uh, adder circuit, uh, these are our desired outcomes. Uh, we ended up creating a circuit uh, that looks like this, our simple adder. However, when adding multiple numbers, we actually need to go a little bit more complicated. We need to add A plus B, so we need to factor in the carry bit. So we added two simple adders. We simplified that um, to its own function diagram. And these are all the mathematical logical outputs that we can have. We have three inputs, that actually means we have four, uh, eight outputs in total. Okay, so finally, uh, since full adder can only do addition right now, um, we need to think about all of the other mathematical um, applications in terms of addition. That's why I went through that whole series of math uh, a few slides ago. So we're going to modify our full adder circuit to be able to do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And that gives us a circuit that's called an ALU, which is a key part of the curriculum. So let's create an ALU together real quick. So the first thing that we need to do to the full adder is to add a switch that can allow us to do addition and subtraction. Now to do that, uh, subtraction needs both B and B negate, so we can do adding B or subtracting B. And we've already found that we need a decoder, will give us 
B or the opposite of B, and then we need a multiplexer to basically select and we want addition and subtraction. We already have these tools at our disposal, so now it's just basically adding them together. So in this combination of circuits, we're basically going to create a programmable ALU or, uh, that can basically take the addition of A or and plus B or A minus B. Um, so basically, if we have zero coming into the multiplexer, we'll do the basic default um, of addition. If we select one on the multiplexer, we'll end up switching to subtraction. All right, so we're going to combine the full adder circuit, uh, the code circuit, and the multiplexer. Give your students a moment to try to figure this out on their own. And our final solution would be this. We have a full adder as a function diagram. We have a multiplexer or a decoder. And now we have a circuit that can go from addition to subtraction. Now, we already know how to make B negative, so why don't we add the ability to have a negative value for A? And once again, it's going to be the exact same process. So we added A negate, and now we're starting to get a little bit more complicated. We have the option of A or B uh, as both positive and negative numbers. Finally, we also need to do some comparative analysis, so we need the ability to do AND or OR. So we basically add AND OR uh, and then a full adder, use a multiplexer to choose between do we want AND OR or addition, and that addition circuit can do the subtraction. Uh, and now we have this massive circuit that can do all sorts of different functions and we can program it and reprogram it uh, whenever we want. Finally, uh, that gets simplified to this little diagram in ALU. Uh, and this is where it starts getting more abstract. Uh, but as subcomponents, the students should be able to understand how the full adder works. They should be able to understand how the multiplexer works. Um, so even though this looks scary, as we've built up, they, they, we understand all of these basic components, so we can actually start seeing how they all interconnect. Now the ALU, like anything else, we add multiple ALUs to generally 32 or 64 ALUs in uh, series, um, and then we combine those with a big, huge, massive OR gate, and this becomes a 32-bit ALU circuit, which is the primary component of your CPU. And that gets simplified to this diagram, which you will notice is from the computer science curriculum. So now we understand how and why this works, rather than this talking about this big hypothetical magical thing, which is this magic. So this is our 32-bit ALU function diagram. Um, and then when we look at von Neumann architecture, this is how everything look, works together. So once again, von Neumann is covered within the uh, curriculum. We have our ALU, that goes to our memory, our memory address and memory directory. Uh, we have our uh, control unit. Um, and then all of our inputs and outputs, so this is a very abstract view, but at least now the students understand kind of how these things are built. Now, once again, memory is a very big component of this computer science curriculum, so why not actually take a look at how memory is actually built? And this is the D-latch, which is actually a one-bit memory circuit, and once again, it's only five logic gates in a sequence, so this is within the realm of what we could expect from a student within the computer science. So now we can actually understand how memory works, rather than just knowing RAM is this, ROM is that, and just trying to memorizing the function of things without actually understanding how they work. <clears throat> now once again, uh, once we understand that, we can look at registers, which are also a key component. Uh, we can add uh, multiple memory units together to create both of our read and write registers, uh, which looks at the MIR and then the R registers within the ALU. Uh, and then we can also look at the control circuit and how the data flows between the uh, ALU and the CPU uh, within the electrical circuitry. So I've gone really, really quick and covered a lot of things, but you can see the connections uh, that I'm trying to propose here, where you know, we're not actually ch making radical changes to the existing curriculum, uh, but actually just trying to find those connections and those links uh, that should be there already, and really bringing in those aspects of electrical engineering, uh, which currently are absent, uh, to give students a much deeper understanding of how and why the computer hardware works, how we can create a circuit that can think for itself, and then hopefully, um, you know, we can start looking at how do we go beyond our current paradigms so that we can actually create a circuit that can break these rules and go a step further, so that we can actually get to the point where we actually have true AI rather than this intelligent algorithm, which are dependent on a very binary system. All right, uh, so all of these resources, uh, experiments, and everything will be available on Sino Exchange. Um, so uh, if you'd like to incorporate any part of the curriculum that I've, I guess that I've proposed, 
uh, they will be available for you. So thank you very much for coming, sort of for keeping me a little bit late. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, and uh, yeah, that's all there. What you just gave us, how many weeks of that is, is, is a curriculum so, for students? Uh, so that uh, there, so sorry, got 100 bus credit out. Yeah, they okay. Okay. Bus Anyone taking the, the, the bus? Oh, yeah, yeah. they want, want to the bus. Who wants the bus? Sorry. Uh, you, thank you, Scott. Thank you yeah. yeah, so I condensed 120 hours into one hour for you. Oh, so yeah. that's why it seems like that's that's okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, the, the whole idea of the organic pro and AI, that's, you're going some black mirror stuff right there. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's going to take some time. Well, what's time. really interesting, we were having a conversation about yeah. this, but one of, they're actually using, for one of their experiments, is a reprogrammed version of HIV. Uh, because of the way that oh, HIV works. Oh, 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 oh. So it's like, what happens oh. if that breaks containment? Uh, yeah, but there well, are some really interesting things with viral research in the brain. Oh, I love it. Thanks for, uh, uh, yeah, I won't sleep tonight. So that's good. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Have a great day. Yeah. All right, so yeah, the bus, I guess, is leaving in three minutes for anyone taking the bus. Um, if you're not taking the bus, I'm available to stay a little bit later if you'd like to ask questions. But there wasn't just a, like, you were comparing with the IPS. Yeah, so, um, Only six hours are given over for that. <laughs> yeah. uh, with the ITCSE, they basically have year one is all about hardware, and then year two is all about software. Uh -huh. um, so the AP Computer Science A is very similar to the ITCSE paper two. Uh -huh. um, but the, uh, the new uh, AP Computer Science Foundations is more closely aligned to the ITCSE paper one. Um, so yeah, this would not be appropriate for I just, uh, AP computer science, which is very focused on the programming. There's n nothing really for hardware in the AP computer science A. But this could be a very good, if you're doing like an enrichment or a club, a very good supplement um, mm -hmm. where you can then provide students with alternative options to explore in the enforced theory. Um, so. Yeah. So, like, I think it's too short time. So maximum I could do is to add the binary addition, binary uh, addition and subtraction, I still understand what the logic is. And the good that, because I don't have time for that, yes. like, it would be great to show all this, right? And I use that there is a website called Logically, so you can sh show, like, oh, here are two toggle buttons that is above, so if you have this on, that will be all, that will be all. Yeah. That's maximum. Yeah, so, like, when we design this whole proposed provision of the program, we understand that, especially if you're in an exam based system, it's not going to meet the, the IB or AP uh, standards. But it's very easy for people to you know, talk about this utopian idea of, hey, let's make changes without actually doing the hard work to propose what those changes are. So what we're hoping is that we can demonstrate what a change could look like, and then hopefully that will kind of gain support. Um, but the could use the they don't have to use the curriculum, they can use pieces of it. Anyone on the bus? Uh, bus support. transportation? Uh, no, thank you. Yeah. So basically, we're just trying to provide as much support for teachers because, we, like, everyone is burning out with the demands after demands after demands. Uh, so it's just kind of nice for to help each other openly to say, hey. <laughs> so uh, probably uh, we're this is the process of translating the whole curriculum. We've, got, we've done the whole curriculum. We piloted it in two right. schools. Um, so it's probably going to take us another three or four months to translate the uh, so it's bilingual. Mm -hmm. uh, but at least all the experiments um, are, are available. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. I'm going to share with my students. My students, I have two students, they went to EA on Tropical Okay. So that would be great. That would be great. And uh, so if you are looking at how to... Uh, were, you were in the morning session, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so uh, the link for all the components Anybody that you Anybody else use, has luggage um, over here? Yeah, Our others uh, under the electronics yeah. resource section. Perfect. Perfect. Two uh, luggage by, there's one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. uh, they have all the resources just to show. Like, You're taking uh, the class now? Like, all right. Okay. They just do. They don't show any diagrams or anything. Uh, I have circuit diagrams. I have mm -hmm. the component list. I have video tutorials, uh, handouts. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to show you my Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, that's like, 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 like
Sì, 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 sì,